Welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> What's up? Welcome hey. back. Well, Hello. So we're going to do another one of these. Uh, last time we did one, we do about every month, eh, roughly. Last mm -hmm. time we missed our friend Kelly. She was absent from that one. Hope you brought yeah. a note. Do you have a doctor's note, Kelly? I do, actually. Okay. I was like, hey, I had a really special event. I'm going to get in big trouble. I will no longer be allowed to be in this friend group. <laughs> and they were like, I totally understand. Here you go. Okay. We're, very, we're very particular and picky, obviously. Mm -hmm. and we are. And we yeah, do demand. readily eject people from the, the friend yeah, group. Yeah, you seem very elitist, <laughs> for sure. We've ejected people from the friend group for far less, you know. Yeah. Group. Anyway, joining me as always, Lauren Rosen, Kelly Frankie. Uh, to spectacular OCD specialists from Cal Southern California and host of the Purely OCD podcast. So there. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for thank having you. us aboard. If I, any of you are visiting from our end, that guy is Drew, Drew Lincelotta. Obviously, this is his channel. He's awesome. <laughs> he, he writes books. He's in school for uh, to become a, a therapist himself, actually, and uh, will be a wonderful addition to the field. Very good, as long as they don't get ejected from the friend group before then. Well... <laughs> No guarantees, man. Sorry. Let's <laughs> go. Tough room. So anyway, today we are going to be talking about why the words we choose in recovery kind of matter. And I think this is a great, great topic that we made up 10 minutes ago. So, yeah, it's yeah, true. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was only about 10, 15 minutes ago. Um, Who wants to open this? Lauren, I think it was yours, right? Yes, I guess it was my, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of ways in which the words we use impact mm -hmm. recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the one that I threw out was the I can't versus I won't, although there are countless other examples. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just the idea that oftentimes we'll hear people who are in recovery say things like, well, I can't do that or my uh, one of the sort of ways that this is manifest is like oh well my ocd or my anxiety kept me from doing x mm. and it's a problem right it completely strips us of our power and our ability to change mm -hmm. is that a thing you guys would challenge when your clients bring that to you the language yeah I mean, because it's the flexibility piece, right? It's like if we say we can't, then the, there's no room for future growth or flexibility in any way. And also there's a part of like owning it, right? Like having ownership in, I I am just not willing to do it right now, mm. Mm. right? Yeah, the okay. right now, that's the best part of that, right now. It's right okay. now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay. Well, let's, how can we make steps towards that? And it, it just keeps the conversation going for growth and change versus just shutting it down right there. Yeah. yeah I can't. Yeah. Right. The other one, what Lauren, you mentioned my anxiety may or kept me from, or made me, mm. made me. Mm. Do that. That's another, another one. Um, yeah. I would just sort of, you can kind of see how it's an iteration of that, right? Like I couldn't say no, or I had to do this because yeah. of the fact. Yeah. Um, but I think in that, oh, shoot, I was going to say something and it's gone. Bam. Mm. Out of the friend group. That's it. Done. Mm -hmm. I'm out. Oh, you're getting the cut, man. <laughs> On too many times. Yeah. It happens. Uh, well, go ahead. Did you get that thought or no? No. All right. It's gone. So there's the, well, my anxiety made me or I couldn't do that, which is essentially can't. Another one that I, I like to attack sometimes because I'm that way is X, Y, Z makes me anxious. Usually it's mm. coffee makes me anxious. Mm. Does it? Or does it change the way your body feels? <laughs> right. Like well, and even down to thoughts too. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that thought made me anxious. It's like, well, it's actually kind of your interpretation of the thought that, yeah. made you ang that, that, that led to the anxiety or that created the anxiety or... Yeah. That trigger made me anxious. It's like, well, the again, interpretation of it is really what we're talking about there. Yeah. Which is yeah. Really nuanced, but I think that matters. It does. It's it comes off as like as if we're being nitpicky, but in reality, we're not. It's like truly, shockingly, there's a lot of research that shows that how we talk to ourselves really matters. That mm -hmm. we start to 
internalize that voice, right? If we're constantly critiquing ourselves or beating ourselves up, it's like, well, not surprising. That doesn't go well. And we have low self-confidence. <laughs> so not why would it be strategy. any different if we're saying I can't? Or yeah. even with children, if you hear them saying like, I don't know how to do that. Okay. So then that's like saying I can't do it. It's like, well, right now in this moment, you don't know how to. And let we're going to learn how to do that. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how to do that yet. Or I can't. Yeah, I don't know how to do that yet. Then that's okay. Because we are going to learn. Yeah. It came back to me. I the thing earlier. Oh, thank God. I'm am I gonna be back in the front of the public? On the eject button. You're lucky. <laughs> oh, ooh. Um, so uh, I think part of the reason that it's difficult, whether we're talking about the I like straight up saying I can't do something versus I'm not willing at this point, or uh, putting it on the like, well, the anxiety sort of made me do this or I couldn't resist is I think part of the reason that that's a go-to is that that it's the element of self-compassion is so difficult for people, mm -hmm. and the uh, in that holding oneself accountable while also being kind, right? Like that's a very delicate balance to keep. And if you can't hold both of those, then of course you're going to say, "Oh well, I had no choice," because mm -hmm. the other alternative is to beat the living pulp out of yourself, and so making space for there to be like, oh, well, I'm working on this and I'm making progress in this way, or I'm willing to do this and I'm working toward my willingness to do this yeah. is, is a really, I think that's an antidote to that issue. Yeah. You're probably right. It lets yourself off the hook to a certain extent. Yeah. Which yeah. if you can't be kind to yourself while you're on the hook, then. Then when can you? Right. Yeah. 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 And that would lock you into there's that, you know, there's that argument. And I think, so I, I'll make two points here. One is that if you're going to stick to the old language, I can't, I, it made me, it does this, it, 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 not me, it, it, it. Okay, fair enough. But it's really hard to say, hey, Lauren, hey, Kelly, help me. But I'm also going to stay locked in that language that, that negates all the help that you're giving me. Mm -hmm. Isn't that mm -hmm. a, that's a tough one? That's a tough place to be in. Like, you're not giving yourself a chance. To, Absolutely. To, to at least be open to the idea that maybe a change of language could be something you should at least try. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And one way we do that too is just in session ourselves is when somebody's challenging something or they're doing an exposure or it's not necessarily like correcting them every single time, although I might do that at time when there's a really strong language that's going on. Um but just how we speak to our clients is over time learning because we are going to hold you accountable yet do it in a really compassionate way. Mm -hmm. And we will use that language so that eventually it will start to kind of sink in. It's like, well, well then what got into in the way this time? Okay, so let's talk about it. And not judging, not saying what's wrong with you. <laughs> and a lot of times clients will go, I didn't want to come to session because – and I think we've actually had a whole conversation on this, but – I didn't want to come to session because I didn't do my homework and I thought that you would judge me, right? Zero judgment. Yeah. Let's actually find a way to get, see, look what happened, what got in the way, how can we troubleshoot it? So then they go, oh, wow, maybe, maybe this is how we talk to people, right? Inclu right. Ourselves included. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. And it's funny because some of that language, it's not only on the Let's see. It's not only on the client side; it could be on the helper side. Yeah, so, mm -hmm, absolutely ridiculous, horrible, like bleh, cliches. Like we never fail; we either win or learn. Ugh. and that's horrible. But it's true, it's and, so and true. It sort of encourages that change of language. Like, stop saying you failed. What can you learn in that I know. situation? Yeah, as long as you learn something, there's no fail. And I do believe it really isn't. I so believe. I believe it so strongly. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Having that growth mindset is so key to to the recovery process. It is true. Seeing every sort of pitfall uh, or thing that you might see as a failure as actually the impetus for growth. Like it's not even just seeing as not a problem, but as necessary yeah. and fundamental to, to the happen. process. Yeah. Um, it has yeah. to be. So I think people would then tend to ask like, okay, so I've just started talking about it different. Well, that changes everything. Well, not necessarily, but mm -hmm. I think some of the stuff that you were talking about before, like you're giving up your power. If you just say, I can't, 
you know, okay, well, you're giving up your power and your agency. And that comes in the realization where the language might give you a chance to distance a little bit from the crisis so that you can slice that those time slices into tiny, tiny slices. Mm -hmm. Know that there's a small slice between the stimulus and the response that you get to act in. Yeah. Yeah. And changing the language tends to like get you into shoehorns you into that moment where you can make a choice where you thought. Mm -hmm. there was a choice. I don't know if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. Yes, I totally agree. And I think it's almost like it, it's an element. It's an interrupting element. If you know that you have this tendency to say, I can't, and you have that, that sort of awareness that you're cultivating, then you hear yourself say it, you're going to go, wait a second. This is a, it's an indicator to me that I need to sort of take a look at what's going on right now. Yep. So it's not even necessarily about the words themselves, but about recognizing where the messages that you're handing yourself all the time are, are sort of thoughtless potentially and are contributing to the problem. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. I'm looking for a quote, by the way, that I think is going to be. Changed. Oh, I think I have it in my office. Is it the Viktor Frankl quote? No, it's not a, Victor, oh. it's a different book, uh, Chatter by Ethan Cross. Oh. Mm -hmm. I haven't read it, but I've, yeah, I've read parts of it. It's yeah, I'm, cool. I'm a big fan. He does this whole thing about third party speak, where you talk oh. about yourself in the third party. And this, again, he's not just making it up. There's a fair amount of research, some of which he did himself, that talks about that. He calls it distancing. So, Sometimes changing the language really matters and that people who talk about themselves in the third party and reference themselves, not so like, oh, what's going on? It's come on, Drew, you can do this. You know, mm. I might say to myself, it actually seems to make a difference. Like we can validate that empirically. So, yeah, yeah you can see why the words and the way you talk about it can make a difference. Mm -hmm. and it's really interesting. Right. Super interesting. I love that. And it can be framed in the self-compassion piece, too. Right. Is like I'm here for you. I know you're, you can do this. Even that, that language can be. Yeah. They call it linguistic immersion. So if you're going to always say, I can't, I, I felt I did, you know, that's, that's a tough spot. But if you start to talk about yourself in the third person, as silly as that might sound, because we don't normally do that, you distance yourself from that immersion and you get a little bit of space that you can yes. work in. So hmm. it me fascinating. I love I'm that. having this epiphany moment of, I guess it's not an epiphany, but a thought around, I wonder if having a client write a letter to self for something that they're feeling really stuck on. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. letter to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I can see Like, that. I know you don't want to do this because it's so uncomfortable and it's painful. And this is, it's almost like this self-compassion letter yeah. of, that could be probably empowering depending on who you're doing it with, I guess. But. Yeah, it, it might be because if I watch, I mean, I don't want to watch you struggling, my friends, but if I was watching you struggle, I watch from a distance. So I get a little bit of objectivity. If I'm struggling, I have no distance. So that right. write to yourself, talk in the third party helps give you that little bit of break. I want to read that book. I'm it's curious. Great. I know. It's so chatter. chatter. Yeah, it is chatter. Right. yeah, chatter. Yeah, chatter. Okay. Essentially all about how conventional wisdom says, go inside and tap into your inner voice. Uh -huh. We all know that in this environment, that goes way off the rails. and he, oh, way. Way off the rails. He wrote about it. It's really fascinating. It's a good book. Quick read too. We'll get through it. And does he give you examples of like how to do yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. He okay, gives cool. some really interesting examples. Uh, one of the cool things was uh, getting into an awestruck state where they hmm. use, use nature as part of the therapeutic process so if you put oh, yourself like in, the, in the middle of like zion national park it's beautiful you're mm -hmm. awestruck you are outside of yourself instantly and your yeah. struggles are distant now and mm. the differences that some of the studies that have been run with like veterans that combat veterans with ptsd like the difference is astounding and mm. it's, it's all about interrupting that internal like in go inside and, and chatter with myself it talks about co-rumination why we think commiserating with each mm. other Seems to, it's supposed to be good, right? Mm, it has a limit and then it goes bad. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but it's a lot about this, what we're talking about today. The language, the language, the language matters. That's so interesting because when I was on my journey of recovery through trauma work, I think being in nature was the key element to it is I was really in the moment. Yeah. Mm. And out of your own head. Yeah. I was like in it. I was looking mm. at all the beautiful, cur being curious about everything. It was such like, it was a break from my mind. So yeah. yeah. yeah There's such a clear it, element of connection in that. that yeah. That grounded. Of, yeah. Gets yeah, I mean, you outside of yourself to your right. point. You yeah. get it within the eye speak and you start speaking or at least engaging linguistically or 
you know, what well, relational frame theory, here it comes yeah. <laughs> with the outside world. <laughs> um, anyway, wow, we went off on a tangent, not a book review. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I got us there. I throw We're, we're not, no, it's, it's <laughs> well, but bringing it back to where I think it, it started with like getting outside of yourself like, and how that, that element when you, when you brought, brought in Ethan Cross's book is like, um, when you are talking to other people generally, I, I find it's sort of when you're trying to reflect on what your genuine values are or the way that you want to behave in a situation, it's so much clearer to see in terms of how you treat other people. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that like that third person language is so helpful in that because we are generally kinder and because of that objectivity. So sort of channeling that and saying mm -hmm. like, oh, this is really hard for you right now. Um, or mm -hmm. I, like I see, and I guess that's actually second person language technically, but do you know what I mean? Like having some sort of space between like, uh, like talking to yourself as though you are somebody else mm -hmm. is going to maybe give you, uh, it's going to hook you into how you want to be as a person versus the patterns that you have uh, been practicing for a long time that are ingrained and that are oftentimes related to fear of judgment and wanting to do it by everybody else's rules, not your own. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's easy to be kind to other people. Ah, we never be kind. We're never kind to ourselves. Why? So that's, yeah. that's a really good point. What about the, not just the, not just the words themselves or the linguistic choices, but I also think that the frequency of the, the amount that you talk about this tends to be an issue too. How mm -hmm. often, you know, and I, I always tell people like in the thick of it, I would have told anybody with two ears and a, and a half a second how I was feeling. Like I would want to tell everybody because that was just the most important thing in the room all the time. Mm. How, do you, how do you get people out of that rut? Are you talking about when you, with OCD or panic or? Yeah, what I think kind of all of those things. Like it, it just becomes the most important topic in my life. And I just want to talk about it constantly to anybody who will listen. That's a tough yeah. one to be too. That's a language thing. And I, I would say it's getting too much airtime, right? Because we're putting it on a pedestal yeah. and we're saying this is, this is the most important thing, which then says, oh, right. We have no power over this, right? Yeah. Instead of taking action and steps that try to treat this instead of just talking like let's take action instead yeah and well, it almost becomes compulsive talking about it right yeah it kind of does you know if you're well you guys know you have an audience yeah. as well you know what it sounds you know what the comment section looks like so right. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 what a bad thing i mean I, I was there too we all went we were all, all of us yeah yeah absolutely but this is the problem with traditional psychotherapy in this context as well is that the idea we look back to Freud and the idea of abreaction, right? I mean, I have a cathartic emotional experience by reliving this challenging thing and then I'll get over it, right? Like then I'll be free of it and we can move on with our lives. It's like the, the idea yeah. that like if we grieve properly, then we can sort of move on. And generally speaking, it's not, it's not as limited as that we like there's almost something addictive about wanting to go back over it because it's going to give this release that you can kind of become hooked on the road like that relief or release or whatever that that catharsis is versus saying like no this is just this is going to be part of the experience and i don't i don't necessarily want to give it as much airtime or talk about it as much because i've got I've got other more, more important things going on and then starting to center other things in your life is probably actually going to promote you moving forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even with, with all of that experience. Yeah. 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 I think that, and that compulsion to talk about it all the time is almost justified by sort of that Freudian thing that was built a hundred and somewhat years. No, we have to talk it out. Talking about your things is good, right? That's good. Right. Yes. Not always. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> no, actually getting to living our life is the most important thing in this instance. Yeah. And yeah. that might include not process, not processing it by talking out loud yeah. around it. The interesting thing come up to you guys might appreciate the whole processing. I need to process it. I need to unpack it. And I always like to think, well, you know what? Right now you can't unpack it. Mm -mm. You'll be able to unpack it when the day comes that you don't feel like you have to unpack it. Then you're probably yeah. going to unpack that's a good point. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent point. 
Totally. And that might be a different type of processing than you expected. It might be more of like grieving. Sure. Or right, some type how it impacted your life and how you want to do things differently versus, oh my gosh, I can't handle this feeling. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's interesting that, that it, we kind of took this turn here because it it sort of speaks to one of the other language things that I think can be really problematic, um, which is that we don't necessarily, when we talk about thoughts and feelings, we often confuse the two um, and also thinking. So mm. for in this, this is where the connection initially came about from what we were talking about is processing and feeling an emotion are two very different things. One is cognitive. It's thinking about the emotion. It's chatting about the emotion. And the other is actually being with the underlying physical sensations that comprise that emotion. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if we're saying, okay, you know, it's, we want you to accept your feelings. Sometimes people then go, oh, well, then I'm supposed to process it a lot. I'm supposed to think about it a lot, which is not what we're talking about at all. Um, mm. But it's, it, yeah, the, there's a couple in that realm. Like I, I'm having the thought that versus saying, I feel like, like that's a big one that I think mm -hmm. can be super problematic because when you hear, I feel like it, it confers a certain amount of like importance to it. Like, mm -hmm. like, oh, well, it feels that way. So it must be that way versus saying, I'm having the thought that this is the case and I feel anxious. Yeah. Right? I notice I'm feeling anxiety come up when I, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've tried to get people to just do, and uh, I'm thinking end of story. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking mm. not, I'm thinking about, or it feels like, or this means just, I'm thinking, Oh, I'm thinking again. Oh, I'm feeling. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I love that though. Like processing, you know, experiencing an emotion. Well, one is an experience and one is an action. Like having an emotion is an experience. Processing an emotion is an action. Two different yeah. things. Right. Yeah. But there's already like tons of mental compulsions going on that is an action as well. It's like this mental event. Yes. Of... <sighs> this is exhausting. Yeah. <sighs> it is exhausting. Yeah. But just... it is. It's the difference oh, between yeah. like processing it out loud versus processing it in your head. Like those are, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can even see where this discussion would fuel some like consternation now. Am I processing? Am I experiencing? Uh, am I thinking like, Oh, it's really hard. Just like, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know. Let me throw a word out to be <clears throat> this way. Get the, the crowd all riled up here. <laughs> here. Here's a word that I would strike from the line. Well, uh, there's a couple of words I would strike from language, but one of them, and this is, I know people don't really like when I say this, I would strike the word healing from the language temporarily. Temporarily. Temporarily, not permanently. Everybody's okay. healing. We probably all have some healing to do. But sometimes it makes me crazy when people talk about their anxiety recovery as a healing process. When what if it's a learning mm -hmm. process, just as much as healing, or as opposed to healing? This, mm, yeah. to healing has a connotation that like there's some sort of thing I'm, that's broken I need to fix, mm. or I have a, an impairment of some kind that I am trying to repair. And right. I don't, I'm not sure that that doesn't really put you in a good spot. Right. Yeah. It'd just be me. No. I can see that. And I wonder if part of that too is like that you're going to some, like you're going to start resisting the experience because the, the experience needs to be changed. Like it mm. kind of has that flavor of it in terms of like, I have to heal from the anxiety or the feeling versus um, I'm actually trying to learn how to live with it. I can kind of see that being a part of what you're talking about. And also just the idea of like, it's almost there's disruption in it more than healing necessarily, right? Like we're looking to actually like, like sort of drudge things up a little bit so mm -hmm. I can see where like totally. the, that word is so sort of laden that it might be not as helpful. I might the, word, the, wrong. the word puts you behind the eight ball a little bit too, because if I break my leg, I might want to go to the gym to fix my leg, but I have to wait for it to heal. Because it is mm. weak at the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you, while I'm, on, I'm trying to heal from anxiety, it automatically says that you're incapable in some way, or your, your capabilities are diminished. Your state mm -hmm. of your perceived state of being may be may, a state of well-being may be diminished, but are your capabilities really diminished? Because isn't that part of what's driving the, the avoidance anyway? The idea that I'm diminished, my capabilities are diminished. Right. I have right. to heal first. I have to wait for the right time to get all. Of yeah. This right. 
Right. Once all the the ducks are in a row, then I can jump into my exposures. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, there that's my little rant about healing. I like how you skillfully did not jump on my bad wagon, which is a big thumbs up. <laughs> so like, I don't know. I think I kind of did. I know. Yeah, I you, you did, did a little bit, but yeah, no, I get it. I know sometimes people and you know what? If you like the word healing, hey, don't let me tell you. You know what? I don't think it comes up a lot in where yeah. I I don't see that a lot. So I wonder if it's um exclusive to Maybe, Maybe uh, your Facebook groups or something. Or, or, yeah, I mean, I hear all the time, I'm healing my nervous system. I have to heal from anxiety. I'm on my healing journey from anxiety. And like, oh, okay. That's where I was seeing it is like th this yeah. idea of like, we have to resolve the experience. Like you're not supposed to feel anxiety at the end of this or, and that's, I actually, I will totally get on this bandwagon with you 1000% is that it's sure. different from it is fundamentally different from going to the doctor and say like, okay, I have this broken arm we need to, to fix. It's like the end game there is for the arm to no longer be broken. Mm -hmm. Right. And our, sorry. Yeah. Kel, and, it. Well, no. And that's exactly, it's the opposite in a way is like, we're actually saying we actually want to live with the broken arm. We want to learn to live with it. We want to learn to go to the gym, like you said, Drew, mm -hmm. and actually work with the broken arm. So it's like the metaphor, it only has a certain extent where it then starts to not work here. It's like we actually are learning how like healing, it's almost like we have to reinvent or give it a new de definition, right? It's like healing actually means feeling anxiety, Mm -hmm. Like yeah. healing our relationship with anxiety as opposed to oh, healing anxiety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Healing is like, well, I have to rebuild my broken self. And I, like my assertion would be like, no, no, you're learning that you weren't nearly as broken as you. Yeah. Said. You're learning. Yes. I do right. like the learning piece. Yeah. yeah it's I'm alternative language. There you go. My work here is done clearly. Yeah. If I change one, one word for you today, let it be that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're about 26 minutes in. What do you get? You have anything else that you want to talk about language? We could probably talk about this for hours. Oh yeah, yeah I'm sure. For sure. So, so what practical tips now, now I come into either one of you <laughs> as a client, you know, we got it. We have to try at least to give them one video where we give them something at the end where we solve a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Can we not do that? I'm, I'm convinced no. that at the end of every one of these videos, everybody's like, okay, but I still feel like crap. And they didn't, <laughs> they didn't fix that. Okay, but that's the whole thing. Thank you. Yeah. There it is. Is like none of this is going to happen overnight, too, right? Like I actually was going to end on this note. Let's do was, it. Okay, was that us saying, "Let's talk to ourselves nicely. Let's talk about willingness mm -hmm. versus I can't." And I'm, and all of those language things is like you have to do that. You've been talking to yourself like shit for twenty years or forty years. And now you're going to learn a whole new set of skills of like consciously redirecting and restating the statement and talking to ourselves kinder and holding ourselves account accountable. It's not going to, you're just not going to feel better. It's not the one solution. And it's going to take a long time before you actually integrate that as, oh, this is how I talk to myself. I don't have to like stop and go, oh, I need, I'm not, I'm talking mean to myself. It's like, it's actually going to take a long time before you get there and it's integrated yeah. and it's not going to happen overnight with it with all the stuff we talk about mm. that's true yeah that's a yeah. shift like anything else is going to take some time and practice you're going to get it wrong you're going to fall back into old habits that's just the way it is that's how we're wired yeah yeah, yeah. i love that it's not going to be just this one aha moment where you're like oh i'm all better now if only oh yeah. self-compassion boom uh <laughs> yeah there right? it is yeah, yeah. Well, there's the, the difference between yeah. the cognitive understanding and the experiential learning oh. that yeah. happens is like the that it is much if it, please if it were just down to a book then one person would have written a book and then we'd all be you know nobody would ever need anybody else or any other help or support yeah so when yeah. you find yourself talking in in cruel ways to yourself you know what the answer to that is this aggression will not stand, man. This aggression will not stand. <laughs> I know by the way that you said that, that it has to be a little <laughs> it, right? yeah. it will not stand, man. <laughs> this will not stand, man. Um, anyway, thanks, everybody. <laughs> um, can I throw one other thing oh, out yeah, as an, like an addition to, to all of this is that 
uh, going back to Drew's point earlier, it's the, the words, we don't want to be pedantic here. We're not trying to be nitpicky and you don't have to get perfectionistic about using the right words. That's not like the point of this conversation. The point is to look at maybe what what you're assuming to be truth and how like that, the, the easiest way to catch that is reflected in the language that we use. And mm-hmm. so if it's like, I can't, it's not, oh, well, that's a bad word and you should never use it. It's, it's an identifier to me that you're, that you're operating through this lens of like almost a victim consciousness versus a growth mindset. And that we probably want to look at that. So, um, because people can turn all of these things into like black and white mm-hmm. to really, recognize that like this conversation is actually just more about awareness and developing awareness of, of what, what your language could be telling you rather than like, you should always, you should never use that word. Um, right. So. Or being prescriptive. We're not trying to be prescriptive here. Say mm-hmm. these words. Yeah. Yeah. No, no not at all. No, yeah. no. Enough. Very good. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Let me uh, put everybody up on the screen here. Lauren, you're not on my screen anymore. Let's I'm not. So if you want to find these two fine human beings, you can find Kelly here at the OCD therapist. And Lauren is at the obsessive mind. By the time I type it, everybody will go away anyway. So I can't. Don't worry it. about it. It's uh, fine. Mm-hmm. And you should be listening to Purely OCD, which is Lauren and Kelly's podcast. It's really good. Oh, thanks. thanks. Thanks for having us again and not ejecting us out of the friendship. <laughs> well, yeah. Did I make it? Are we okay? You did. You made it you all almost the didn't, Lauren. He lost your name on his. I mean, he did. He <laughs> deleted it. He was like <laughs> halfway there, man. Button. Oh I my believe God. That you were you were actually booted by Nathan Peterson a few weeks ago. Oh, Nathan. I, Nathan's a good dude, though. So, like, if you're going to be he booted, is. you'd be booted. Yeah. By Nathan. Yeah. No. That's true. true. It's a good replacement. I'm honored. I'm honored to be booted by Nathan. All right, folks. Thanks for coming out and hanging out with us. If you have more comments or questions, just keep posting them here on YouTube. And if need be, I will drag Kelly and Lauren back in to answer them. I ain't letting you know. So love being dragged. Yeah. (laughs) See you next time. We're out. (laughs) Bye.